found in the course of working at New Relic for the last uh, year and a half or so. And I felt like, wow, I must not be the only person that doesn't like know all this stuff. So my hope is to be able to kind of share uh, the things that I've learned with you guys, and hopefully it will at least drive you to be able to ba ask better questions. Um, so my hope is at the end of this, uh, you'll be able to do a couple things. Um, one, you'll be able to recognize which kinds of IP protections work under certain situations. Uh, you'll be able to understand how IP laws can have a positive or negative impact uh, on your open source community or on your development project. Um, you'll be able to uh, understand how to share contributions and also to get contributions that are sort of properly protected by IP law. And uh, last, you'll be able to pick the processes that work for your project. So uh, I will always be the first to say I am not a lawyer. I am certainly not your lawyer. So while uh, I am an engineer and an engineering manager, um, I might get some things wrong. So feel free to correct me. I'm happy to continue to learn the state of the art. Uh, and the laws, you know, it's a very like organic thing. So laws change, uh, decisions change. Uh, and I'll be able to share with you at least some of the very recent uh, happenings that I think uh, are very interesting in the IP space. Um, so I like to think of this as IP literacy for developers. Um, so I have developed uh, kind of a similar course for New Relic engineers so that uh, as a New Relic engineer when you come in I can kind of like, you know, educate you on the kinds of things that we look for, what to watch out for. Uh, but ultimately, I don't really think that this is really something specific to New Relic. I mean, I think this is good education for developers in general. Um, so the best way that I've been told to kind of think about uh, intellectual property is, you know, rather than thinking about property like, you know, this, this drink is my property or my iPhone is my property, um, it's actually helpful to think about intellectual property as being a bundle of rights. And so each of the sticks in that bundle represents a specific right that I have. So for instance, um, if I buy a piece of land in my neighborhood, right? So uh, right off the bat, I have the ability to um, build a house, let's say, on that piece of land. Like that is one of the rights that I bought with that piece of land. But that doesn't necessarily give me the right to mine for minerals, right? 500 feet below the surface. That doesn't give me the right to frack on it. Uh, that doesn't give me the right to put a satellite in the air a thousand feet ahead. Um, that doesn't even necessarily give me the right to the water that runs in the stream by my house. Um, so intellectual property is the same way. It's not the right to just like have the thing. It's all of the individual rights that are associated with that piece of intellectual property. Another useful way to think of the law as an engineer is to think of the law as the world's largest legacy code base, right? All the way back from the code of Hammurabi to present times. And much like legacy legacy code bases, uh, interoperability is kind of a secondary concern, right? So there's federal laws, there's state laws, uh, there's local laws. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the United States. There's plenty enough to fill the talk with that. Uh, but you know, as a grain of salt, note that anything that I talk about may be very, very different depending on what country you're talking about. So. Uh, there's way too much to cover there. Uh, and the way that I like to think about sort of these incompatible laws is that integration testing basically happens in the courts, which is a terrible place to do integration testing, but that's kind of the way it works. So uh, the big overview of IP law is to think about kind of these major tools or major areas of laws, right? So copyrights, patents, trademarks, and trade secrets. And uh, I'll walk you through each of those and kind of explain how they're different, uh, and then we'll see them sort of applied to specific projects. So copyrights are pretty simple. Um, I like to think of like the moment that uh, code sort of flies off my fingertips, uh, copyright happens, right? So by virtue of US copyright law, regardless of whether I publish something or file for a thing, the moment it's off my fingertips, it's copywritten, uh, which is kind of interesting. I mean, that, that's kind of cool. Um, so for something to be copyrightable, they have to be uh, tangible works. It has to be my work, it has to be tangible, it doesn't matter if I publish it or not. Um, and, it, and it covers what they call the expression of an idea. So that's useful for code. Um, it's easier to think about it for books or for works of art or for music. Um, I'm dating myself, but if anybody remembers like Vanilla Ice and the Ice Ice Baby, where he took the bass line from David Bowie's Under Pressure song, do you want me to hum it? Dun 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 Yeah, that one. Um, like that was at the time, you know, this is probably like 20 years old, like, I mean, that was kind of like the eruption of sort of like copyright law uh, around music, right? And, and we all kind of know how that panned out. Not terribly well, actually. So when you think about copyrights, 
Uh, copyright ownership, the moment that I make a thing, I am the copyright owner. However, as a software engineer, if I make a thing but I'm being employed by a company, typically I'm assigning the rights to that thing that I just made back to my employer. So as a work for hire, um, it is not mine even though I made it. So that, you know, that thing where it flies off my fingertips and is mine, like it just whoosh, flies off to the company. Uh, and that typically is going to be part of the paperwork that I signed uh, when I joined that company. There are some weird situations that you can get into, however. So let's say that you're uh, an independent contractor and you go and you build a thing for a person and you don't have a contract in place where uh, you've assigned rights to the person that hired you. You may actually own the IP that you've created, right? You may own the copyright to it. Um, that puts you kind of in a, in a special case condition that's actually very similar to like a wedding photographer or a, a school photographer. So if I hire somebody to go and take you know, pictures of me and my wife and our dogs, and I don't uh, have a contract where I sign rights back to them. Uh, the guy that took my picture actually owns the copyrights to the photographs, even though it's me and my wife and my dog, and right, I set up the whole thing. But by virtue of copyright law, he owns it. So what that means, much like software, the photographer, in this case, has the ability to uh, reproduce the work, right? They have the ability to create derivative works, right? So they can take that picture and chop it up into little bits and, you know, glue it to something and call that a different piece of work of art. And, and they have the rights to that too. And uh, they can distribute it. They can perform, well, okay, perform it. That doesn't really get, make any sense. But uh, if you take it back to like musical performances, things like that, uh, they could perform it and then display it. So, um, you know, if they have the right to take my picture and they own the copyright to it, Right? He can put that in his gallery, he can put that on his blog, you know, it's not mine. It's very similar for software, so if you're in the weird condition where you don't have a contract <coughs> in which you're assigned rights, you as the developer also have very similar rights here over the code that you've written. So, I mean, I'm not saying the lesson is like, you know, go contract with people but don't sign contracts, because um, that maybe isn't the best way to arrange a relationship, but uh, it's interesting that you can get in this condition. So trademarks are a little bit of a different animal. So trademarks, uh, by virtue of the name trademarks, are, are marks, right? So they are symbolic representations of a brand or of a product or of a person. So things like uh, the name or uh, the icon or even sounds and colors like the, uh, when Windows boots up or when Mac boots up, right? The little blings, that kind of thing. All of those are actually trademarks. So trademarks are interesting in that they're also bounded by a certain geography or a certain market. So, uh, for instance, uh, like Monster, like Monster Board, right, is a brand. It has its own set of trademarks, and that plays very well as being like a job hiring, recruiting tool, whatever. Uh, but there's also Monster Cables, right? So Monster can be used in kind of multiple contexts and multiple domains, and, and that's totally fine. Uh, trademarks are different from copyrights in that, you know, generally speaking, you do have to register them in order to defend them. So there's a couple ways of doing that. One, you show uh, intent to register something by using the little TM, which never really made sense to me. It feels like the TM should be like after you trademark it, but you know, whatever. Uh, and then once you've actually registered the trademark, you know, then you use this guy, the little circle with the R in it. So one of the weird aspects of trademarks is Part of the deal with a trademark is that when you trademark something, it's not just a one-time, like, I trademark it, yay, I own it, and now, now I don't have to care about it. Uh, the law actually compels you to defend your trademark. So if I trademark a thing, and then I let other people go and use it, and abuse it, and parody it, well, okay, parody's not a good example, but let's say I let other people use it, and I don't defend my ownership of that trademark, um, I actually can lose the trademark because I didn't show the due diligence of being willing to defend it. So that's why you run into all these, you know, sort of like ridiculous cases where people are sending cease and desist letters to companies and to organizations and open source communities for sort of misappropriating their trademark. And it's because the law compels them to. If they don't, they lose the right to that trademark. So let's talk about patents because that was kind of in the talk title. Uh, patents are probably the most interesting beast when it comes to software. So patents basically give you a certain right. And if I go and file a patent, basically what it means is I file a very, very long piece of specification. And that specification, if it's approved, basically gives me exclusive rights to a thing. Right? It gives me the exclusive rights to build the thing, to manufacture the thing, to sell the thing. Right? 
Um, but patents aren't about uh, concepts. The thing about patents is ideally it's something where it is a invention that's been reduced to practice, right? I can't just go, oh, I've invented a time machine. It's in my head. I'm going to make a patent. People have tried, but you can't do that. So you have to be able to produce uh, proof that you've reduced it to practice, that you can build the thing. That makes perfect sense if you're going to build a you know, tricycle lawnmower thing, which is a real patent. But in the case of software, um, it's a little bit dicier, and I'll get into why. So why patents are useful uh, outside of software is because it gives the person that owns the patent the exclusive right to build the thing, and it prevents competitors from being able to build the same thing. So uh, if I file for a patent, I am the owner, but in most cases, I'm going to assign rights to that patent to someone else. So uh, a good example is um, uh, Amazon's uh, one-click shopping cart. Uh, there's a patent for that from probably like 1997 or something like that. And if so, you read through the patent and you know, there's some uh, you know, screen uh, mock-ups and little design diagrams and there's a thing where you click it and it talks about how the shopping cart works and all that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, there's no uh, software that has to be filed as part of that patent. And the patent, you'll see uh, probably at least a half dozen people, including Jeff Bezos, right? I mean, somehow he was involved in coming up with that. Uh, but, but fundamentally, when they assign the rights, when we talk about that bundle of rights again on the, on the patent, the assignment of the rights for that patent generally goes back to the company. And so you see this again and again when patents are filed. There will be a list of inventors, so they recognize that patents are filed by people, but the rights are assigned to companies. And this is one of the uh, tricky bits with patents is there's, there's often a fair bit of politicking around like who gets to be listed as the inventor on the patent. Um, interestingly, uh, if your patent comes up in a dispute and there's any cause to believe that the list of inventors is inaccurate, meaning you left somebody out, you know, you left out, you know, Sally the intern because, heh, she's an intern, she doesn't belong on a patent. Uh, but if she actually was part of inventing it uh, and you didn't list her as an inventor, uh, if your patent comes up for a dispute, you may lose your patent. So give Sally the intern credit. Patents ultimately were meant for good. Um, as much as we hate, uh, well, okay, some of us hate patents in software right now, the reason it's there is, is for mostly good reasons. At least that was the original intention. So if you look at uh, you know, other industries, so uh, pharmaceutical, biomedical, um, even industrial, um, what it does is it allows people to invest money into innovations and to have coverage to be able to sell those innovations and recoup uh, the time that it took and the money that it took to develop that innovation to begin with. Right, which makes perfect sense if I'm building, say, an electric car you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you can think of other examples. Uh, pharmaceutical, obviously, is, is highly reliant on this notion of a patent giving them 20 years of safety before they lose the ability to license it out as a generic. Um, the other thing is that patent licensing, regardless of when it expires, the lifetime between being able to make the thing, file the patent successfully, and the patent expiring is a long period of time that a patent owner can relicense the patents that they own. And this is frankly uh, how you know, patent trolls are successful in what they do, because the licensing provides them the revenue to continue to do what they do. And I'll, I'll get more into that in a bit. Um, the interesting thing to note is that software patents, you know, patents for software, have only been around since the 1990s, right? Um, so, you know, it's not been for very long, and the state of the art in terms of uh, assessing the validity of a patent for software um, is getting better, but is fundamentally kind of flawed. So, some things to think about as a software engineer is that you can't patent an algorithm, you can't patent a theory. What patents do is it provides you a specification for applying those algorithms, applying those tools to a process or to an outcome. So in the case of like the Amazon shopping cart, like I'm not, they're not copywriting the shopping cart, it's, you know, the, the one click button itself or the idea of the one click button. They're, 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 they're patenting the use of the one click button inside of a shopping cart process that results in selling stuff, right? Um, so it is part of a real world set of results and that is kind of a fundamental requirement of a patent. Again, it can't be, uh, you know, completely cerebral. So patent applications, uh, as I stated before, don't include the code. Not only do they not include the code, they don't actually even require working code. 
So I don't know anywhere else in software engineering where I can sell an idea and get people to pay me lots of money and I don't actually have to produce any working code. Right? This is an amazing quality of being an imposter. Right? If you want to be an imposter, like, go into patents. Like, if, you can, if you can work that system, you will be an amazing imposter because you don't actually have to write any working software. But patent applications, uh, they do include things like diagrams, descriptions, architecture, architecture, you know, all that kind of stuff, which, to be fair, does require some artfulness to do right. Um, so the, the average patent is going to take you a period of time, right? It's going to take you at least two years to file, maybe up to four. Uh, it's not cheap, so anywhere from five or ten to fifty thousand um, dollars. And you can think about, right? I mean, how many startups have lived and died in the span of two to four years, right? So your average startup can not only not afford to buy a patent, to go through the process of patenting, by the time they could file a patent, it is irrelevant to their business. So patents don't make sense, right? And you'll you'll actually find this sentiment very often on, with you know Silicon Valley investors. Uh, you know, that, that you know, for their startups, for the investments that they're making in, in small startups, patents don't serve them well. The other thing to think about is that patents aren't a guarantee. So if I file a patent and I get it wrong, or I'm uh, uh, disputed because there is some other patent that covers it and I, I just don't get it granted, I'm kind of SOL. And it's actually pretty hard to get right. I can't go and file a patent on my own. I mean, I probably could, but it's very unlikely that my patent would be approved. To really work the patent system, you have to use a patent attorney. I mean, that's, that's just how the system works. Um, if you do it incorrectly, and your patent attorney could actually do it incorrectly too, but you know, hopefully you've paid a lot of money, so that isn't the case. Um, your patent could be invalidated if you don't do it right. So a good example would be, um, I make a thing, and I publish something about it in a trade paper, or uh, you know, I describe how it works, and you know, kind of overlap with some of the claims that I'm making in the patent. Well, guess what? By the time I file my patent, if I, if I do my patent filing after I've published this trade paper, I may actually lose the ability to secure that patent, uh, which totally sucks because the patent is completely public. Right? When I file a patent, anyone in the world can access my patent. And so if I've done a really terrible job of sort of protecting my secrets while trying to secure my patent, I may have just given away all of my rights if I didn't land that patent. Totally sucks, again, for startups. Right? Who's going to screw this up but a startup? Yeah. That's right. Correct. So, do patents kill startups? Could be. Um, another thing, that, oh, another way to think about this is to think of it from the troll side. Um, I hate to like anthropomorphize this, but um, so if I'm a, if I'm a, uh, what they call a. Um, a non-operating body, if I'm a, a patent troll, where I'm a company where I don't actually make anything, I don't actually sell anything, I don't actually distribute anything, I just buy intellectual property and turn around and use that. One of the things that's unique about being in that role is I can buy a patent and I can enforce it immediately. But if I build a thing, I have to wait at least a couple of years, probably three, before I can claim any sort of exclusive rights. I mean, I have a patent pending, and that's helpful. But really, it's securing the patent that makes it truly defensible. So uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a patent troll, right, I can, I can multiply this. I now have a business model, right? I can go and secure a bunch of patents. They could be overlapping. They could be conflicting patents. It doesn't really matter. Now I've got all these patents, and I can look for targets, people that have other, other uh, inventions, right, that are potentially conflicting with my patent. I can go and sue them. And even if I lose most of those lawsuits as a patent troll, right, I still have the ability to win some of them or settle some of them out of court. And the way that most of them are settling is I'm either going to set up some sort of patent licensing, meaning right, you as the uh, sued person recognize that I am the true patent owner and therefore you will license your stuff, or sorry, you will license my stuff so that you can continue to operate your business. Um, you know, theoretically I could push to try to get your product off the market, but you know, as a patent troll that actually doesn't serve me very well. Uh, the licensing and the royalty deals are what serves me well. That's what creates my revenue stream so I can go buy more patents and sue more people, right? Um, awesome business model if you're a patent troll. Interesting patents. Um, so uh, 23andMe, they, they used to do genetic testing that was kind of a big deal for a while. They've been pushed to take that off the market. Um, 
Uh, a few years ago, 23andMe filed a patent for a, a kind of an interesting idea. And it is a method, for, a software method for being able to take uh, you know, genetic information around you know, sperm and eggs and essentially come up with a scheme for designing babies, for designing the perfect set of attributes right, in a human individual. So uh, other data point, you can't actually patent naturally occurring genes, right? If it occurs in nature, you can't patent it. But if I can develop it synthetically, you can. And that is how people like Monsanto can uh, patent things like, you know, seeds, right? So patented seeds, for instance, are a great example where, like, I come up with a seed, uh, it's not naturally occurring, I come up with a license model. Now, all the people that want to use this great seed because it's like, you know, Roundup, uh, uh, you know, it's tolerant to Roundup, right? Um, it, it gives me the opportunity to, you know, build a thing, patent it, go and resell it, relicense it uh, for, again, at least 20 years. Um, so GM seeds can be patented. Natural cannot. Um, I can patent the ability to come up with a method for generating a certain type of individual with certain types of attributes, right? I can basically patent how to make the perfect babies. How awesome is that? What I can't actually patent is the baby itself yet. But maybe, someday. Um, anyway, if you actually go and read this particular patent, it's kind of fascinating. Um, if you've ever been on like the front end of a software project where you start like brainstorming the things and like drawing the maps with the arrows and kind of doing all this like creative thinking about what it could do, like that is essentially what's in that patent, but with like a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo. No software was actually built, and uh, after like a ton of outrage, as you can probably imagine, because this is kind of weird and people get all flipped out about it, um, they never actually built the thing. So, but they own the patent. So if someday somebody builds this thing, they own the patent. So, IP law is really strange, isn't it? There's been some pretty recent happenings, however, that are a little bit of light. Um, so just last week, there was a ruling that came out of the Supreme Court for uh, Alice Corp versus CLS Bank. So Alice Corp is a patent troll. They're one of these bodies that uh, uh, you know, has a portfolio of patents, and they just go and attack you know, other companies that have similar things that they do. Uh, and CLS Bank basically provides uh, escrow services for uh, electronic transactions, electronic payments. And so the Supreme Court ruling that came out of that basically said, you know, automating an abstract idea that is a common practice, like providing escrow services, right? There's nothing new or unique about that. They've been doing that for thousands of years. Um, in and of itself, right, on a generic computer uh, is not patentable. And, and like, this is kind of like, I mean, this is big news, right? Because if you go and look at all, all those friggin' patents, they're all abstract ideas executed on generic computers. So what that means is they're basically saying, we recognize that patents are somewhat fallible, and, and these patents right here, these are not good patents. Um, so that's great. There's definitely a lot of energy around trying to improve the patent process, uh, especially around software. Uh, if you go to the electronic found, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF.org, uh, you know, they will basically point you to another site where they talk about like, all of the reforms they would like to see in patent law. And so like, one of them, are, as an engineer, is kind of a no-brainer, is like, you know, patents should come with code. Right? I mean, that seems straightforward. But today's patent office is not equipped to handle right, a pull request or a bunch of GitHub code. I mean, that's just, just not how they work. Um, other interesting news, so Tesla Motors uh, recently announced that they were open sourcing their patents for their electric vehicles. Um, also pretty cool, I mean pretty awesome from a PR perspective. Uh, so uh, Tesla Motors, if you went into like the entryway of their offices, like they had a giant wall of like all of their patents, right? I mean this was kind of like, you know, I mean this was something they had a lot of pride in, right? They built all this cool stuff and all this cool technology. But at the end of the day, you know, Tesla's been extremely successful, right? I mean, if you look at the market for Tesla Motors, they truly have no real competitors, right? They've, they've built something and they've innovated, they've disrupted their market, right, in VC speak. Um, so that's great. So the nice thing about disrupting a market is that this thing, right, it well outpaces the patent lifetime. So, you know, while it's an awesome PR stunt, it's also good practice for them because those patents are now irrelevant, right? There's no reason they can't give those patents away, let other people use them, because fundamentally they're no longer a threat. Um, the other thing to think about is that uh, even though pat the, the 
patents were released by Tesla, what they don't ever release are their trade secrets. And I'll get into why uh, that is kind of a key aspect of it. Uh, and I love this quote from Elon Musk where uh, you know, he talks about like originally when he was starting the business, like he thought like, you know, patents were just like part of the technique. Like, you know, we were only going to be successful if, if we did patents and really defended things. And you know, he since has changed his tune and now calls patents the lottery ticket for a lawsuit, which is pretty awesome. So trade secrets. So as a startup, the trade secrets are basically your primary tool of the trade. So uh, to be a trade secret, you don't have to register anything, right? Which would be silly because it's a trade secret. But the main aspects of a trade secret are that it has to meet these three requirements. So you have to keep it a secret. Like that seems really non-obvious, right? Um, it has to be unique and non-obvious to speak of non-obvious. So it's not something that someone should just be able to stumble upon. Like it is something that you know you've built or you've discovered. Like it took some work to get there. Uh, and then lastly, a trade secret has to give you a specific advantage, right? It gives you a competitive advantage. And part of that advantage is derived from the fact that you can continue to keep it a secret, right? So Coca-Cola, right? Very good example. Krispy Kreme, WD-40, right? There's lots of common household examples of trade secrets where there's some secret formula, right? And by virtue of keeping that formula a secret, right, it continues to be special. So when we talk about secret sauce, uh, trade secret, you know, trade secret and secret sauce are kind of used in interdependently. Um, you know, so I mean, I could talk about like a new relic or Google, wherever you're from. Like, you know, sometimes you look at the work you do, and it's like, okay, well, you know, what do we do is our secret sauce. What's our secret sauce? Is it our web app? Is it our agents? Is it this? Is it that? Is it the way that we aggregate data? Right? Um, you know, fundamentally, what is the secret sauce? And so, secret sauce is not just code. I think that's an important distinction that most engineers don't really think about. So uh, the way that you operate the code, the way that you operate your infrastructure, the way that you stack your hardware and configure it in a particular way, uh, your curated list of customers, right? There's so many different aspects of what you do as a business that are part of your secret sauce. And those are fundamentally trade secrets. So why trade secrets are particularly useful for startups um, and really for businesses in general, is you know patents give you 20 years protection, like tops, right? At the end of that 20 years, everything's public, no holds barred, generic drugs, the whole bit. But trade secrets can actually last forever if you properly cover them, and if they continue to be relevant, right? I mean, keeping a secret of something that uh, is no longer manufactured or cared about doesn't really matter. So, uh, you know, Colonel Sanders, right? The 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 chicken recipe, obviously a great trade secret. The only thing that can blow a trade secret uh, is either that you've disclosed it, right? You have failed to keep it a secret anymore, um, or you've, or someone has managed to reverse engineer it. So uh, anytime you come across, you know, some new piece of software and you go into the license, there's always some clause in there about, you know, part of your license agreement is that you agree not to reverse engineer, right, the product that you've just licensed from them. Um, you know, pick any product, dig into the license agreement, you're going to find a clause about reverse engineering, and, and this is why. Because fundamentally, as a user, if you reverse engineer the product and can build it just by virtue of inspecting it from the outside using totally legal matters, that thing is no longer trade secret. And so they've lost that form of protection in the legal sense. Uh, another great example for, which is that little doodad down there. Uh, so there's a Kickstarter project called HackRF. And it is a reverse engineered NSA spy kit, which uh, I thought was pretty cool. I don't know if they actually trademarked or patented that, but whatever. Um, so corporate IP strategy. So this is the way that most basic uh, corporations are going to operate in terms of uh, how they work with IP. So they treat IP, uh, and you'll see this in the IP strategy books that are written for executives and things like that. So they treat IP as a flexible asset class. Um, so it is something that sits on a balance sheet. It's something that has value, like a building, right? And you know, they very much treat uh, IP as what they call the sword and shield strategy. And what that means is you know, it is both uh, uh, an item I can use to attack my competitors, right, if they're building something that threatens my business model, and I can also use it to defend myself from being attacked. Right? And, and fundamentally, when you think about the way that most big companies operate with IP and trademarks and patents and all that, um, it is very much with that you know, sword and shield mindset. Which, of course, uh, as Elon Musk uh, sort of noted, again, as the, the lottery, the, the, what is it called, the, the ticket to a, uh, lottery ticket to a lawsuit, 
uh, it can occasionally become like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Your, your hunger to protect or to hunger to fight yourself actually in, invites you to, to be in more fights. So most corporatized peace strategy is going to involve using a combination of all four, right? It's never just patents or just trade secrets. Uh, your bigger corporations are going to be using all of those in the context of a particular product. Uh, a great example of this, uh, I love this example, is uh, Premarin, which is a hormone replacement therapy drug. So Premarin came to the market, oh, it's probably been over 60 years. And so when Premarin filed for a patent, which at the time they got 17 years of protection, uh, now it's 20, which is great, um, you would have thought that at the end of the 17 years, right, that a generic would have come on the market, that someone else would start making Premarin because they'd published a patent. Like the chemistry's all there, why can't somebody else make it? Well, the thing that, that, that uh, I think it was Pfizer, uh, the thing that wasn't released about Premarin were the trade secrets. So while they released the chemistry on how to create Premarin, what they didn't release were the secrets as to how they extracted uh, the chemicals needed, right? How they actually manufactured it. So the unique thing about Premarin is it's derived from the extracted urine of pregnant mares. So while they told people the chemistry how to make Premarin, they didn't tell people how to get the pee out of the horses at an industrial scale. And that is the secret to being able to take a drug like Premarin to the market. So when you look at your own company, and this is a fun exercise, you know, part of you goes, well, okay, which of this is the patentable technology, and which of this is us getting the pee out of the horses, right? So let's talk about your projects, because um, I think we do a lot of uh, talking about IP in the context of the businesses that we often work in. But you've got your own dig, right? So uh, licensing is generally the method by which we take a thing that we own and we allow other people to use it. So regardless of what kinds of rights I have, whether it's patents or trade secrets or blah, 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 if I want other people to be able to use my thing, I have to provide them a license. If I don't provide a license, they actually have no right to use it. And that's a very key distinction. Because IP law is all about that bundle of rights, and I own them, or the assignee, right, my company, or whoever, I mean, they, they own it. And so if you're going to allow people to use your thing, licensing actually sets the, the situation that you allow them to use it in. So they're not just a legal contract, but they're also a social contract. So for instance, I could, if I wanted to, uh, come up with a license that dictates you know, who can use it, uh, how they can use it, where they can use it, and what conditions. I can add all the restrictions that I want to as, as the owner of that IP. And you know, obviously, the harder I make it for people, like the more they have to read through the legalese, the less likely it is that they're perhaps going to use the thing that I built, which uh, you know, if I'm building an open source project, that is kind of like the antithesis of my goal. So you know, be mindful of the licenses that you choose, that you know, the choices that you make will influence how people can use your software, where they can use your software, and also how you can continue to use your software as you've licensed it. So the way that licensing can impact it uh, so if you look at a typical license, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, don't look at an MIT license, which is an extremely permissive license, which is awesome. But if I look at a, a sort of less permissive or more regulated license, like a GPL, uh, there's, a, there's a, some dictation about uh, how certain conditions can be handled. So the thing to keep in mind, and I'm not going to go into all the details of all of those conditions, because that is like another talk in of itself, but consider that your license basically allows you to operate within an ecosystem. And it either you know, helps you operate successfully that, in that ecosystem, or it makes it hard for you to operate in that ecosystem. So when you think about your software and who it's for and who, that, who is in that ecosystem, right? some licenses are going to be more friendly than others. Um, you know, if you are a Node.js developer, as, given, as an example, uh, and you're building community node modules, you're probably going to license them as MIT or BSD because that's what the other kids in that ecosystem are using, and that's what makes it friendly to people within that ecosystem. So there's other great resources for how to choose a license, um, including choose a license, which GitHub just came out with finally. Um, but generally speaking, the TLDR is, you know, all code should have a license. Um, don't write your own. There's lots of great ones on the OSI. They're extremely troublesome to write. Just don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Um, think about the ecosystem that your, that your software needs to live in. Um, and also consider that there are dual licensing options. There are certain license types that could uh, you know, operate together. You know, or you may want to choose to be able to 
uh, have a closed license for certain conditions, but an open source license for communities. I mean, MySQL is a great example, right? Um, I can operate you know, MySQL freely in certain modes, but I can also choose to take a commercial license of it uh, in a commercial mode. The license you pick is going to influence right, uh, attribution. Uh, and again, GPL is a great example where it's going to have very specific requirements for you know, how do you attribute code, right? how do you attribute the license that you're using as part of your project. Uh, again, it's very dictated. Um, and it's, the main thing to know is that if you choose a license, you must abide by the terms of that license, including the attribution terms. If you don't, you actually open yourself up to a lawsuit. So, um, you know, the, the obvious example that um, is the, what is it, the SCO Unix and IBM case that's been going on for like over a decade where, uh, you know, SCO Group basically uh, sued IBM for a billion dollars saying that uh, they misappropriated uh, parts of the Unix kernel and implemented it in the Linux kernel. And that case has been going on for like over a decade and just, you know, I think it finally got thrown out, but who knows, it may pop its ugly head up every now and again. <sighs> So these sound like big project problems. You know, I just built this little tool. It's this little thing off to the side. And people kind of want to know, like, how does that work, right? So uh, to start, right, if I'm starting a project, starting an open source thing, um, or at least intending to build a thing that I share, um, the starting place to think about, like, who owns the project to start? So when I first make the thing, right, it's mine. Like, that's the most simple, happy path. Uh, unless, of course, I did it as part of my employment, in which case it's theirs. When I get to the second contributor, right, it's me and my buddy Kathy, um, and Kathy starts working on the project. You know, what does Kathy own? Well, interestingly, under copyright law, the moment that Kathy, Kathy writes a patch and wants to send it back to me for, for my project, uh, Kathy is actually the copyright owner of that patch, right? And so one of the things that I have to do as the project owner is I have to find a way for Kathy to legally contribute back to my project uh, so that I can actually use it. So we call this assignment of rights or assigning rights back to a project. And there's kind of three sort of common methods that people use to do that. Uh, so uh, we'll walk through them. But the first one is open sourcing the contribution back. Uh, number two is CLAs. And number three is the CAA. Um, this one's actually the easiest example, but uh, is a little hard to pull off because you really have to choose a particular license type that plays with this. So uh, the license contribution basically would say, you know, Kathy, when she contributes back to me, basically licenses her patch, right, under the same license. So if I have an Apache license uh, on my project, you know, Kathy, as a contributor, now is sending things back to me, and those things are also licensed uh, as Apache. Um, those are nice because that's kind of it. There's no thinking about it. It's just done. It's a really low barrier to entry. The one that you probably run into more often in bigger projects are CLAs. So a CLA is, is really more of a contractual agreement. So it's, um, it's, it's basically going to contain a bunch of legalese that says, you know, you as the contributor uh, are granting all copyright and all patent licenses to the project. Right? So I'm going to submit a bug or I'm going to submit a patch. And you know, I'm claiming that you know, I own the work, I own the copyright, uh, but I'm licensing it back to you. And I also make some statements about like, you know, oh, this is done on my personal time, right? It's not part of a company work, and you know, I have the right to do this work. And uh, many, many uh, projects will also have corporate CLAs uh, because there is such a gray area around, you know, if an individual developer contributes back to a project, like how can we ascertain that they're working as an individual versus like working, you know, during their their work hours or on their computer, you know, that they got from work, right? There's a lot of gray area there. So a lot of bigger projects will actually ask for a corporate CLA where those have to be signed off by someone that is a, you know, agent of the company. So very often those get bubbled up to the legal department and then stall out for weeks, right? Which uh, fundamentally kills people's excitement around like, I'm going to work on open source and now I'm waiting on legal, right? So there's some arguments against CLAs. Um, as a project owner, tracking the paperwork and tracking contributors and all that stuff is kind of a headache. I mean, I've got enough other problems to work on, right? Um, the more interesting aspect of it for me is that the CLAs, if you read through the text, right, it talks about you know, me as a contributor saying, I have the rights to do this thing. And oh, by the way, I take on all the risk around patent infringement and copyright violation rather than the project. 
So think about it. If you're going to start your project with a CLA, right, you're basically creating a relationship where you say, hey, thanks, welcome to the project. I love your PR. By the way, we accept all the risk for patent and copyright stuff. And can you get your legal team to sign off on that? Cool. Can't wait to merge your patch. Right? Uh, that's not a great way to start a relationship. So CAAs are uh, a, a different twist on the matter. So uh, a CAA is similar to a CLA, but instead, the contributor assigns you as the owner, right? So I'm assigning you the ownership of the patch, and then you, in turn, are going to license it back to me to exercise within the context of my contribution. Uh, they call that a grant back. Uh, the only reason that they would do this, and well, maybe not only, but uh, probably the primary reason that your project would pick a CAA is that it gives you a single legal authority to make changes to the project. So instead of having a copyright that's owned by the main uh, maintainer plus all contributors, a CAA basically assigns all rights to a single legal entity. And so that single legal entity can do things like relicense the project, right? So maybe it started out as MIT and you want it to be something else, right? It's very easy for them to make that decision. Uh, it's also easier for them to defend things if there's a problem. So uh, GNU is a great example where uh, they sent uh, stuff back to the FSF, and those guys can uh, you know, do the re reinforcement of any licensing or patent issues. So more housekeeping tips. So if you're running an open source project and you need to start getting contributors, uh, first things first, you must track contributions, right? Um, if you're going to use a CLA or you're going to do the CAA stuff, um, secondly, like get the paperwork done before you let people start working on your project. Uh, and then last, unfortunately, CLAs have to be signed in some way, um, electronically or otherwise. So seeing this all put together is probably a useful exercise. So let's kind of step through a couple of examples how other open source projects are doing it. Uh, so Node.js, right? So back in the day, Node.js was written by Ryan Dahl, who at the time was a Joint employee, right? So work for hire, right? So Joint owns Node.js, right? It's pretty simple. They own the copyrights to Node.js. Uh, join it. So Joint also owns the trademarks to Node.js. So all the cutesy symbols and the little hexagonal square that people like to make cool stickers out of, uh, Joint owns that too. And actually, if you read through the trademark license text on the Joint site, um, there are some specific restrictions. So for instance, if you're writing a node module, you can use the joint trademark and you can use the node name uh, if it's open source. But if it's not, you have to get permission. And if you want to create um, cool stickers for your next node conference, you also need to get permission for that because they're basically going to license it back to you as a commercial use. Um, very recently, the node project got rid of CLAs. right? So they used to require people to fill out an individual or a corporate uh, CLA agreement before you could contribute back to the project. Um, you know, very recently they decided that was kind of a pain in the ass, and, and much like I described, they didn't feel right uh, basically pushing all the liability back to the contributors. Right? Node is trying to get more people to contribute, so starting off with a contractual relationship doesn't get more people that want to commit. Another good example, uh, Django. So Django was written by four guys at the Lawrence Journal World, including Jacob, and uh, Lawrence Journal World wrote Django because it was part of their like content strategy thing, which whatever, just kind of bit the dust. And so uh, Django got relicensed uh, as its own framework under BSD. But Django's held, the copyright's held by the Django Software Foundation. So in the case of Django, much like the case of Python, uh, they built a nonprofit foundation, and that foundation owns the rights. Uh, but if you'll notice in the license text for Django, uh, they grant the rights to the Django Software Foundation, and the individual contributors. Um, so CLAs are required. They have both individual and corporate. And uh, the use of trademark are also restricted, right? So if you want to use the Django name, or you want to have a conference named you know, Django whatever, right? then permission's required. Sir, um, how can uh, the Django Foundation and the individual contributors copyright? My assumption is that so the Django Software Foundation is the primary holder, but when people are doing the CLAs, they're licensing their patches, which basically makes them sort of like co-owners. I don't know how they decide, like, do they own like 0.001% of Django? Like, you know what I mean? I, I don't know how all that works, but. So it's not 100% owned by Django. Right. That's my assumption. Again, I and ale. Right. Right. Could to any one of those just as the could to any one of those as well. 
Right. So a license, think of a license as being a license for use. Right? So a copyright I own, license you use. Right? So I can have a thing that I own, you know, the Django Software Foundation owns and we own the copyright, but we license it as BSD so that you can use it under the BSD license. Does that, that kind of help? Yes. Yes. As well as contribute to it. Yeah. All right. Um, last but not least, I'm going to fly through here. So how do I protect my side hustles at work? Um, when you joined your job, you probably had a form called a proprietary information agreement or proprietary rights agreement. It's usually got a bunch of legalese, a big white section, and a place at the bottom where you sign. And if you were like me, you said none or NA, and then you signed it, and you didn't think any more about it. Well, this was actually a really important piece of paper. No one ever actually explained to you why this was really important. Because what's in there is an assignments of rights clause. And what it means is that the moment that you join that organization, you assign rights. Remember that bundle of rights? You've assigned rights to all of your inventions, all of your creations from the moment you start working there up until some period of time after you leave, uh, often you know, three to six months. So that sucks, because if I come up with a side hustle, some cool project, it's very difficult for me to claim ownership of that thing, because I've just signed a bunch of paperwork that says I assigned rights back to my employer. So the thing to know is that the PIAs, um, you know, I talked about right integration tests happen at the court. So PIAs, paperwork, are very generic, and they are overly broad. And they will always be overly broad, because it's the advantage of the employer to make them overly broad. But in many cases, they may contain phrases that don't play well under integration tests. Right? They don't cooperate with the specific laws of the locale. So for instance, in California, there's a uh, you know, specific verge about non-compete. Right? You can't play with those. Uh, states like Delaware actually allow you to do things on your own time. You can't do those either. So uh, the thing to know is that when you sign up for a new company, fill out the PIA and list all of your projects explicitly. That's going to be a key thing about legal paperwork. You must be explicit. You can't just say my GitHub repo. Right? Uh, include all your open source projects as well as open source contributions, even if you're only submitting bugs. And last, you know, read the text. Get a lawyer if you need it. So um, after you've done the PIA uh, and you come up with an idea, you do a thing, it's on your own time and your own resources, you're pretty sure it's yours. Uh, there's actually uh, a pretty good body of evidence that says declaring it in writing ahead of time provides you offer better protection in the event that you decide to take that thing out on your own and it becomes the next you know, Facebook or Google or Twitter or whatever. Now, some companies require permission, but even if they don't, um, declare in writing what you're going to work on. Basically, you're showing good faith and giving your employer an opportunity to uh, evaluate the project. And if they don't claim any ownership of it, guess what? It's yours. So uh, we're near the end. So hopefully you know patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secret. You know why it's important. You get what CLAs are all about. And you know how to protect your side hustles. So there's going to be good reading. Um, this book is pretty awesome. Uh, it is a legal book for engineers. And uh, the EFF is also a great site, as well as the SF Conservancy. So that's it. Questions? Sorry I ran a couple of minutes late. Basically, if you've given them the opportunity to evaluate it, either for competitiveness or if it's kind of within their business domain, and they're like, whatever, we don't build baseball scoring software, or, you know, whatever, um, then at that point, you've got a pretty good defense. It's not a guarantee, right? Because you could build something wildly successful and, send, and, and sell it to the you know, Major League Baseball, and you know, maybe they'll come after you. But you've got a pretty good body of evidence right, that, that says that they had a chance and they said no. Um, so that's a great example. Um, so that's one where if, if there's already a project underway and you're contributing to it, and there's not, right, if there's not some of these protocols in place, then, then you're living in a fuzzy world. right? It's very unclear. So it, it should be that at the moment that you contribute to it, 
um, you own the copyrights to your contributions, right? But the moment all that stuff gets merged together, it's going to be pretty hard to peel apart, right? A successful project is going to have lots of merged content. So by the time it's successful, if you don't have that paperwork in place, who's to say who owns it, right? You're not going to find out until you battle it out in a court if for some reason you have to. Okay. Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>